And here, it may be worthy of observation that if no stipulation whatever were contained in the treaty to secure to the Mexican inhabitants and all others protection in the free enjoyment of their liberty, property, and the religion which they profess, these would be amply guaranteed by the Constitution and laws of the United States. These invaluable blessings under our form of government do not result from treaty stipulations, but from the very nature and character of our institutions. James Buchanan, Department of State, Washington, D.C., March 18, 1848. The highly contentious Mexican-American War began in 1846 after blood was apparently spilled on American soil by Mexican soldiers. The time preceding the war was characterized by strained relations between the United States and Mexico over the annexation of Texas and a border dispute over Texas' southernmost border. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo officially ended the war on February 2, 1848, after Nicholas Trist, a bureaucrat in the State Department, signed it at, Mex at Mexico City. Although it had been signed, the national congresses of both the United States and Mexico had to ratify the treaty. On March 10, 1848, the Senate approved the treaty 38 to 14, and now it was time for Mexico to respond. The United States artificially created the war to fulfill its growing capitalistic needs because of its expanding economy. The United States fetishized the Mexican session in terms of capitalistic ventures because it provided access to the port of San Francisco, the door to the eastern economic markets in Asia, and it provided land for the expansion of domestic economic markets such as the railroads, agribusiness, and mining. In the midst of this economic greed, the United States had put aside the needs of the Mexican-Americans who lived in the Mexican session. Although they did recognize them in the treaty and give them civil liberties such as citizenship, property ownership, and political rights, how far would the U.S. go to protect the rights of these people, considering that they didn't necessarily want to rule over them? In trying to finalize the treaty, James Buchanan sent out a letter to Mexican Minister of Foreign Relations, Luis de la Rosa. He hyped up the end of the war and prosperity for both sides, when in reality he just wanted the treaty to be passed so that the U.S. could see the economic benefit. Of particular importance in the treaty was the property held by Mexicans in the Mexican session. Buchanan had great faith in the judicial system of the United States in being able to secure the rights of Mexican Americans. But as history would tell us, this great faith was actually more naive optimism. Articles 8 and 9 of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo explicitly mentioned that the property rights of Mexicans living in the United States would be inviolably respected. Whatever this meant was under the enforcement of the local governments in the newly acquired territories, such as in California, New Mexico, and Texas. In 1852, Mexican-American property rights would take a huge blow when the federal government enacted the Land Act of 1851, which required all holders of land that were granted by the Spanish or Mexican governments produce legal ownership. But many Mexicans did not have proper proof, because other Mexicans in the surrounding areas just knew where their land started and ended with reference to geographical locations and markers, such as streams and rocks. As historian Neil Foley puts it, Under the American system of land ownership, Mexicans without titles had to hire surveyors and pay Anglo lawyers to draw up new titles and deeds of transfer. Many Mexican landowners were forced to pay lawyers with parcels of land rather than dollars, which most did not have. Over half a million square miles of Spanish and Mexican land grants were thus made available to Anglo-American settlers through laws like the Land Act. In New Mexico, about 80% of all land grants eventually ended up in the hands of Anglo lawyers and settlers. Porfirio Diaz once said, Poor Mexico, so far from God, so close to the United States. After the Mexican-American War, the United States went on to economically exploit Mexican sovereign land. The situation for Mexican-Americans in the United States continued to grow dire as they lost their property, became segregated, and had to work for the Anglo man. Maybe this is why Diaz uttered those words. But from the losses of Mexicans and Mexican-Americans rose a generation of fighters who, empowered by the idea of si se puede, rose out of the ashes and uplifted Mexican-Americans and Mexicans.